These days, not many people carry a sword around with them, unless they want to get arrested. But back in olden times, there was only one way to show how much of a badass you were, and that was to carry around a huge sword in a scabbard on your belt. And the more legendary the warrior, the more legendary the sword. From the guy who found a golden sword in the ground to the most important sword in Poland, here's the 20 most legendary swords that actually exists. <laughs> Number 20. A guy digs up and finding a very nicely decorated golden saber. Here's a guy who went out digging and found something beyond his wildest dreams. A pure gold saber which was buried in the ground. This seems to be a very old sword and probably belonged to someone incredibly important. Maybe even a king. A saber is a form of backsword with a curved blade that was commonly used by light cavalry throughout the early modern and Napoleonic periods particularly in Europe. In the Thirty Years' War, the saber gained popularity in Western Europe after being linked with Central European cavalry, such as the Hussars, for a long period of time. Lighter sabers were also becoming increasingly common among infantry units in the early 17th century. Models with less curved blades were popular in the 19th century and heavier cavalry units adopted them as well. In the 19th century, the military saber was utilized as a dueling weapon in academic fencing, resulting in the development of the present discipline of saber fencing. Despite the fact that single-edged cutting swords such as the ancient Egyptian and Sumerian sickle swords had previously existed in the ancient world, these weapons were mostly used as chopping weapons for foot infantry. The straight, single-edged sword, on the other hand, was often employed by foot troops and cavalry in ancient China, and in the 6th century AD, a longer, slightly curved cavalry variation of this weapon first emerged in southern Siberia. By the 8th century AD, this proto-saber had evolved into the actual cavalry saber, and by the 9th century AD, it had become the standard side weapon of the Eurasian steppes and steppes of Central Asia. With the arrival of the Magyars and the Turk invasion into Europe, the saber became popular. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Sheer Beak from 1320 until 1764, the ceremonial sword was employed in the coronation ceremonies of the majority of Polish rulers. It is presently on display in the treasure vault of the Royal Wawel Castle in Krakow, where it is the sole piece of the medieval Polish crown jewels that has survived intact. A distinctive feature of the sword is its hilt, which is adorned with magical formulas, Christian symbols, and floral designs. It is also notable for having a thin hole in the blade that carries a miniature shield with a coat of arms of the Republic of Poland. During his participation in the Kievan succession crisis in 1018, the legendary King Bolzlaus I, the Brave, is supposed to have cracked the blade by striking it against the Golden Gate of Kiev, according to mythology. In reality, the Golden Gate was only built in 1037, and the sword is believed to have been created in the late 12th or early 13th century. Ladislaus the Shorts was the first person to use it as a coronation sword which occurred in 1320. It was looted by Prussian forces in 1795 and passed through numerous hands during the 19th century until it was acquired by the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in 1884 and displayed there. In 1928, the Soviet Union handed it up to Poland as a gesture of goodwill. When Poland was invaded by Nazi Germany during World War II, Sherbeek was transported to Canada and did not return to his hometown until 1959. As a symbol of Polish nationalism and independence during the 20th century, the sword was adopted as a symbol by several organizations. Number 18. 
Napoleon Sword Napoleon Bonaparte was a French military and political commander who rose to prominence during the French Revolutionary Wars and conducted numerous victorious operations. In 1799 until 1804, he served as the de facto head of the French Republic as First Consul. Napoleon I reigned as Emperor of France from 1804 to 1814 and then again in 1815. During the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon controlled European and global events for more than a decade while leading France against a succession of alliances. He won the great majority of these wars and conflicts, establishing a massive empire that dominated over continental Europe until its eventual collapse in 1815. His conflicts and campaigns are studied in military colleges all around the world, making him one of history's greatest commanders. Napoleon's political and cultural impact has made him one of history's most renowned and divisive presidents, Napoleon fought with a pistol and a sword on the battlefield. He possessed a big arsenal of weapons and artillery. A gold-encrusted sword that formerly belonged to Napoleon was auctioned off for more than $6.4 million in France in 2007. As a wedding gift, Napoleon gave this sword to his brother. The sword was a family heirloom for Bonaparte. The sword was proclaimed the national treasure of France in 1978. Number 17. William Wallace's Sword, Wallace Sword the Wallace Sword is a two-handed antique sword that is said to have belonged to William Wallace, a 13th century Scottish warrior who led a rebellion against the English occupation of Scotland during the Wars of Scottish Independence. William Wallace is claimed to have used it in the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297 and the Battle of Falkirk in the following year. The blade of the sword measures 4 feet 4 inches in length and with the hilt is 5 feet 4 inches. The sword was allegedly given to John de Menteith, governor of Dumbarton Castle, after William Wallace's execution in 1305. However, there are no records to support this claim. 200 years later, in 1505, accounts exist stating that a sum of 26 shillings was paid to an armorer at the command of King James IV of Scotland for the binding of Wallace's sword with silk cords and providing it with a new hilt and plummet, as well as a new scabbard and new belt. Wallace's original scabbard, hilt, and belt were reported to have been fashioned from the dried skin of Hugh de Cressingham, who was killed at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Thus, this repair would have been essential. Otherwise, it would have been kind of gross. Number 16. El Cid Sword, Tizona Sword According to the Cantar de Miocid, Tizona is the name of one of the swords wielded by Rodrigo Daz de Vivar, El Cid. Colada is the name of El Cid's second sword. El Cid was born in the town of Onichian, near Burgos. He came to control the Levant of the Iberian Peninsula towards the end of the 11th century as the leader of his devoted knights. During the Reconquista, he recovered the Taifa of Valencia from the Moors for a brief while, governing the Principality as its prince from the 17th of June, 1094, until his death in 1099. Jimena Diaz, his wife, inherited the city and kept it until 1102, when the Moors reclaimed it. He rose to prominence as a member of the armies of both Christian and Muslim monarchs, El Cid became Spain's famed national hero after his death and the protagonist of El Cantar de Mio Cid, the most important medieval Spanish epic poem, which portrays him as the perfect medieval knight. Strong, heroic, loyal, just, and holy, his family history is unknown. Nevertheless, he was the grandfather of King of Navarre Garza Ramrez de Pamplona, the first son of his daughter, Cristina Rodriguez. El Cid is still a beloved folk hero and national emblem in Spain, with his life and actions immortalized in popular culture. Number 15. Masamune's sword, Hanjo Masamune. Masamune was a Japanese blacksmith from the Middle Ages who is largely regarded as Japan's best swordsmith. 
In the Soshu style, he invented swords and daggers known in Japanese as Tachi and Tanto, respectively. No exact dates are known for Masamune's life. The majority of his swords were manufactured between 1288 and 1328, according to popular belief. His surname is listed as Okazaki in various accounts. However, other scholars feel this is a fiction to boost the Tokugawa family's prestige. At the Japanese sword-making competition, the Masamune Prize is presented to the best swordsmiths. Although it is not given every year, it is given to a swordsmith who has produced outstanding work. Masamune's swords have a reputation for excellent beauty and quality, which is noteworthy at Nara when blade steel was frequently impure. His swords are the most commonly mentioned among those included in the Kyoho Mebutsucho, a catalog of superb daimyo swords maintained by the Hanami family of sword appraisers and polishers during the Kyoho period. The list, which comprises of three books, was prepared under the instructions of Tokugawa Yoshimune of the Tokugawa Shogunate in 1714. The first volume, known as Nihon Sensaku, has a list of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's three best swordsmiths, including Echu Matsukura, Go Yamanosuke Yoshihiro, and Awaragushi Toshihiro Yoshimitsu, as well as 41 blades by Masamune. Number 14. Zulfikar Ali Iba Bitalib's sword is known as Zulfikar. It was formerly shown on Muslim flags as a scissor-like double-bladed sword, and it is typically depicted as a scimitar terminating in two points in Shia images of Ali and in the form of jewelry serving as talismans. Middle Eastern swords are sometimes fashioned with a split tip in tribute to Zulfikar, and Middle Eastern weaponry are sometimes inscribed with a phrase mentioning the weapon. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Zulfikar was commonly featured on Ottoman flags, particularly those used by Janissaries cavalry. In addition, Zulfikar is commonly invoked in talismans. Actual swords were made in Kahar, Iran, based on the fabled double-pointed design. The Higgins Collection, for example, has a ceremonial saber with a woot steel blade and a cleft tip from the late 1800s. A split blade and sawtooths along the edge of another 19th century blade in the same collection combines two probable readings of the name Dhulufikar. This blade was most likely made in India and was paired with an ancient Indian hilt. Zulfikar, an Iranian main battle tank, is likewise named after the sword. During the Bosnian War, a Bosnian army special unit was dubbed Zulfikar. Number 13. King Charlemagne's Sword in medieval folklore, the sword Joyus was used as Charlemagne's personal weapon. Since the 13th century, a sword known as Joyeuse has been used in French royal coronation rites, and it is now on display at the Louvre Museum. According to mythology, Joyeuse pommel was made to hold the Lance of Longinus. This lance, also known as the Holy Lance and the Spear of Destiny, was used to pierce Jesus Christ's side on the cross. Charlemagne used Joya to behead the Saracen leader Corsable and knight his buddy Ogier the Dane, according to Bullfinch's mythology. Joyus, a village in Ardenche, is said to be named after the sword, which was purportedly lost in a battle and found by one of Charlemagne's knights, who was rewarded with an appanage named Joyus. For the first time in 1270 and for the final time in 1824, a sword connected with Charlemagne's Joya was carried in front of the coronation processionals for French kings. Since at least 1505, the sword has been preserved at the treasury of Saint Denis and it was transported to the Louvre in 1793. As it is now, the Joyeuse is a mixture of numerous components added during centuries of use as a coronation sword. Number 12. Sword of Osman Ghazi the Sword of Osman Ghazi was a state sword that was used during the enthronement ritual of the Ottoman Empire sultans. The Ottoman version of the Beya was this form of enthronement rite. The sword was named after Osman I, the Ottoman dynasty's founder. 
The girding of the Sword of Osman was a crucial event that took place within two weeks of a Sultan's throne ascension. Osman I began the practice when his instructor and father-in-law, Sheikh Erebali, girt him with the Islamic sword. The girding took place at the capital Constantinople's tomb complex, Ereyup, on the Golden Horn Canal. Despite the fact that the trip from Topkap Palace, where the Sultan lived, to the Golden Horn was only a short one, the Sultan would embark a boat with much fanfare. Mehmed II erected the Ayyup Mausoleum Complex in honor of Muhammad's friend, Abu Ayyup al-Ansari, who died during the first Muslim siege of Constantinople in the 17th century. The sword girding therefore happened on what was considered as hollowed grounds and linked the newly enthroned Sultan to his 13th century forefathers and to Muhammad himself. Number 11. Tomoyuki Yamashita's Sword during World War II, Tomoyuki Yamashita served as a commander in the Imperial Japanese Army. His accomplishment of conquering Malaya and Singapore in 70 days led to the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill referring to the ignominious fall of Singapore to the Japanese as the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British military history. Yamashita was at the forefront of the invasion of Malaya and Singapore. Yamashita was known to British soldiers as the Tiger of Malaya because of his fierceness and courage. After World War II ended, Yamashita was prosecuted for war crimes in connection with the Manila Massacre and several other atrocities committed in the Philippines and Singapore. He was acquitted with the case. The United States amended its laws on command accountability for war crimes, resulting in the creation of a legislation referred to as the Yamashita Standard. During his military service, Tomoyuki Yamashita possessed a personal sword that featured a blade that had been made by the renowned sword craftsman Fujiwara Kananagana somewhere between 1640 and 1680, according to historical records. As a result of Tomoyuki's trial and execution for war crimes, General Douglas MacArthur removed the sword and donated it to the West Point Military Museum, where it has remained ever since. The sword is part of a large collection of military weaponry on display at the West Point Museum, which includes a number of other pieces. Number 10. Seven Branched Sword the seven-branched sword is a continental-made sword that is said to be similar to the relic of the same name, which was given to a Yamato monarch as a present by the King of Bekya, and is referenced in the Nihon Shoki in the 52nd year of the semi-mythical Empress Jingu's reign. It's a 29.5-inch iron sword with six branch-like protrusions along the length of the primary blade. The original sword has been kept at the Isonokami Shrine in Nara Prefecture, Japan, since antiquity and is not on public display. An inscription on the side of the blade is a valuable source for learning about the interactions between Korean Peninsula Kingdoms and Japan at the time. Since ancient times, the sword has been kept in the Isonokami Kami Shrine. Rust has obscured the writing on the blade, which was recovered in the 1870s by Masatomo Kan, a Shinto priest at the temple. On the sword, there is a gold inlaid inscription on both sides. The Nihon Shoki appears to have referenced this sword. Many experts have attempted to decipher the cryptic inscription. Close-up x-ray photographs of the sword were published in 1996. The sword's origins are thought to be in Jin Dynasty China, around 369, according to analysis and archaeology. The sword's unusual design, with the blade's tip counting as the seventh branch, is reminiscent of contemporary Korean tree patterns. Number 9. Sword in the Stone We are all familiar with the legend of King Arthur and his sword Excalibur, 
King Arthur's greatness was cemented when he was able to pull the sword from the stone. The old Monaceppi Hermitage, located near the Cistercian Abbey of San Galgano in Tuscany, Italy, is home to another sword encased in stone. The sword in the stone, and its tail is in some ways a reversal of the one we are familiar with. Galgano Guidori was a knight who was infamous for his self-centeredness and arrogant attitude. A vision of Archangel Michael appeared to him once, while on Monsieppi, telling him to sacrifice worldly possessions, to which Galgano responded that such a thing would be as difficult as dividing a rock with a sword. Galgano smashed his sword into a rock to demonstrate his point, and according to tradition, to his great amazement, the boulder gave like butter to his blow. However, although dating metal is a tough operation, the sword in Monsieppi has been identified as having originated in the 12th century. Even today, the rock serves as a magnet for visitors and travelers who come to see the remnants of the church that was erected around it. Number 8. The Sword of Gujian The Sword of Gujian was unearthed in a tomb in the Chinese province of Hubei in 1965 by an excavation crew. Archaeologists consider it to be an artifact dating from around 771 to 403 BC. Despite the fact that the sword had been buried in moist conditions for more than two millennia, the blade of the sword remained completely untarnished, which amazed and perplexed all of the researchers when one archaeologist pressed his finger against the sword's edge, the blade drew blood from his finger. It is exquisitely adorned and constructed of copper, bronze, tin, and trace quantities of iron, among other metals. It is believed that the sword formerly belonged to Gujian, the king of Yu State, according to carvings on the blade near the hilt. Gujian was one of the most renowned emperors in Chinese history. The sword of Gujian, for whatever reason, continues to defy the passage of time. The sword is considered a state treasure in China because of its legendary longevity, and it is on exhibit in the Hubei Provincial Museum as a testament to this. Number 7. The Kopesh the Kopesh is an Egyptian sickle-shaped weapon that originated from battle axes that Assassin's Creed Origins fans may be familiar with. A standard Kopesh is 20 to 24 inches long, while smaller versions are also available. The weapon's inward curve might be utilized to trap an opponent's arm or drag their shield out of the way. During the New Kingdom period, these weapons transitioned from bronze to iron. The earliest known image of a Kopesh is from the Steel of Vultures, which shows King Anantum of Lagash carrying the weapon, putting the Kopesh about 2500 BC. Only the outer section of the curved end of the blade is sharpened. The Kopesh is a descendant of the Epsilon or other crescent-shaped axes used in combat. Around 1300 BCE, the Kopesh became obsolete. Several pharaohs are pictured with a Kopesh, and several have been discovered in royal tombs, notably as the two examples discovered with Tutankhamun. Although some specimens have sharpened edges, many others have dull edges that were presumably never meant to be sharp. It's probable that some of the Kopeshes discovered in high-status tombs were ceremonial variations. Number 6. Yamatorij Yamatorij is a tachi created during the Kamakura era's middle phase. The blade and its mountings are a Japanese national treasure. It was wielded by Usugi Kagekatsu, a renowned warlord in the Sengoku era who lived from 1556 to 1623. According to Kanzen Sato, a Japanese sword appraiser and researcher, the name was chosen to celebrate the tachi's beauty by equating it to a copper pheasant feather or a sunset mountain landscape. Furthermore, another sword appraiser slash researcher, Suiken Fukunaga, mentions an idea recorded in Sorinji Denki that the term derived from a wildfire's landscape. The wildfire argument, on the other hand, is highly questionable according to Fukunaga. The Tachi is one of the 35 swords preferred by Usugi Kagekatsu, the adopted son and heir of Usugi Kenshin, the god of war. 
it was afterwards passed down as one of the most important treasures of the Yonizawa Usugi clan, which is the head of the Usugi clans. The Tachi was named a national treasure of Japan on March 29, 1952. Satouchi City bought Yamatorij from a person in 2020, and it was subsequently displayed in the Bizen Osafun Japanese Sword Museum. The purchasing price was around 500 million yen, or about 5 million million dollars. Number 5. Gladius Sword Gladius is a Latin word that means sword, but it refers to the sword used by ancient Roman foot troops. Swords used by the ancient Romans were comparable to those used by the Greeks. The Gladius Hispaniensis, or Hispanic sword, was adopted by the Romans in the 3rd century BC. Based on the weaponry used by the Celtiberians in Hispania late in the Punic Wars. After Gaius Marius reforms, a fully equipped Roman legionary carried a shield, scutum, one of two javelins, pila, a sword, gladius, frequently a dagger, pugio, and maybe in the later empire era, darts, plumbate. Soldiers traditionally hurled pila to destroy the adversary's shields and disrupt enemy formations before engaging in close battles for which the gladius was drawn. In general, a soldier would lead with his shield shield and stab with his sword. Gladi had a tapering tip for stabbing during thrusting and were two-edged for cutting. A knob hilt, probably with finger ridges, was added to enable a secure grip. Welding together strips, which resulted in a sword with a channel along the middle, or fashioning a single piece of high carbon steel with a rhomboidal cross section, provided blade strength. On the blade, the owner's name was frequently etched or pierced. The capulus was the hilt of a Roman sword. It was frequently ornamental, especially on officers and dignitary sword hilts. Stabbing was an extremely effective tactic, since stabbing wounds, particularly those in the abdomen, were virtually invariably fatal. Number 4. The Flammard Rapiers with wavy blades were popular throughout the Renaissance. Flammard fans were under the impression that its undulating design might inflict more lethal wounds. However, the form did have one true battling advantage. When an opponent's blade passed through one, the curves would slow it considerably. A flame-bladed sword, also known as a wave-bladed sword, has a blade that is undulating in appearance. The wave in the blade is commonly said to give the appearance of a sort of flame-like style. The blade's design is both beautiful and useful, creating uncomfortable vibrations during parrying. Rapiers and Zweihanders are the two most prevalent swords with flame-bladed blades. However, there have been other sword types with flame-bladed blades. The German Flemenschwert, which literally means flame sword, is the name given to the two-handed flame-bladed sword. The sole difference between these swords and two-handed swords, or Zweihander, is the blade. They were employed by the Landsknecht, well-trained and experienced swordsmen who were known as Doppelsoldner or Double Mercenaries, since they got twice pay, as did other Zweihanders throughout the 16th century. Number 3. Ulfbert Viking Sword the Ulfbert swords are a group of roughly 170 medieval swords dating from the 9th to 11th century that have blades inlaid with the Ulfbert inscription. The name Ulfbert is a Frankish personal name that has been adopted as a trademark by a number of bladesmiths over the years. The swords are in the middle of the transition between the Viking sword and the high medieval knightly sword. The majority have oak shot type X blades. They also serve as a spring board for the considerably broader high medieval tradition of blade inscriptions. Between vertical strokes, the reverse surfaces of the blades are inlaid with a geometric design, commonly a braid pattern. There are a lot of blades with this geometric pattern, but no Wolfbert inscription on them. Wolfbert swords were created during a time when European swords were still mostly pattern welded, but larger blooms of steel were progressively becoming accessible, resulting in higher quality 
high-quality swords, made after AD 1000, having crucible steel blades. Ulfbert's swords are made from a variety of steels and are made in a variety of ways. A pattern welded core, with welded on hardened cutting edges, may be found in a 10th century burial in Nemelani, Moravia. Another looks to be constructed of high-quality hypotectoid steel sourced from Central Asia. Number 2. The Kanda the Khanda is a double-edged, straight sword with that originated in the Indian subcontinent. The Khanda was revered by Rajput warrior clans as a weapon of great honor. It is frequently depicted in religious imagery, theater, and art reflecting India's ancient past. In Indian martial arts, it is a commonly used weapon. Khanda can be found in Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, and Hindu scriptures, as well as art, when cornered and outnumbered by the enemy. Rajput soldiers used both hands to swing the Khanda over their heads. Rather than being caught, they generally made an honorable final stand in this manner. On the festival of Dasara, people still revere the Khanda. Khandas are reported to have been used by several Sikh soldiers of the Akali Ninghang order. Baba Deep Singh, for example, is known for holding a Khanda in his final combat before dying, which is now on display at Akal Takat Sahib. Khanda is depicted as wisdom piercing through the veil of ignorance in many dharmic faiths. In religious art, Hindu and Buddhist deities are frequently depicted brandishing or carrying the Khanda sword. Number 1. Norimitsu Odachi Sword the Odachi, or Nodachi, is a sort of traditional Japanese sword used by feudal Japan samurai class. The Miao Dao is the Chinese counterpart of this style of sword in terms of weight and length, whereas the long sword or claymore is the Western battlefield equivalent, albeit pretty different. The sword in issue would need to have a blade length of roughly 3 shaku, around 35.8 inches, to qualify as an Odachi. However, like with other terminology in Japanese sword techniques, the size of an odachi is not precisely defined. Huge Japanese swords like the odachi became popular during the Nanbokucho era in the 14th century. The reason for this is supposed to be because of the Soshu school's powerful and sharp swords spread throughout the country, establishing the circumstances for manufacturing a practical large-sized sword. It was hard to pull an odachi sword from its scabbard on the waist since the blade was 150 centimeters long, so people carried it on their backs or had their slaves carry it. During this time, large naginata and kanabo were also popular. However, because soldiers were equipped with yari and naginata, this vogue faded quickly. Furthermore, when tactics switched from fighting with yari and cannons by a big group of soldiers during the Sengoku era in the later half of the Miramachi period to the Azuchi Mo Moyama period, Odachi became even more outdated. When the Odachi became obsolete, it was frequently replaced with Atachi and Katana. Odachi was used as a weapon, but it was also frequently used as a present to Kami, a Shinto shrine, due to its exquisite luck. For example, Oyamazumi Shrine, which is claimed to be a treasure house of Japanese swords and armor, is devoted to the national treasure Odachi, which was dedicated by Emperor Gomurakami, and Odachi, which was dedicated by Omori Noharu and killed Kosunori Masahige. Have you ever tried digging up a legendary sword from your backyard? Do you think swords can give a warrior magical powers? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!